Okay, um, I, I said last time that we would start today with a recap of Hume's ethics to allow opportunity for discussion and feedback. And um, it seems to me that this is an appropriate way in any case of introducing the moral sense philosophers of the 18th century um, that we may reference to along the way. So let me start with the recap of Hume's ethics. Where you recall, uh, the overall question is whether morality is based in reason or sentiment. Feeling. Reason or sentiment. And uh, plainly, the option of it being based in reason is that of John Locke and the uh, Cambridge Clintonists, uh, with their innate knowledge, of course. Uh, as far as Hume is concerned, the question is about uh, what we mean by reason. It has to do with relations of ideas and matters of fact. Relations of ideas, yes, reason can help you to define ethical terms and to interrelate ethical concepts. That's all. And in terms of uh, matters of fact, it can help with empirical anticipations, predictions of consequences. Uh, hence his emphasis on um, a principle of utility. But when he gets that far, the point, the point is that um, matters of fact can tell you what is, as a matter of fact, the situation that you're facing. Um, what um, is likely to eventuate if you take certain uh, actions. But um, how do you get from the is to the ought? And it's to David Hume's credit that in the history of ethics, he's the first one to really point out that question. The is ought question, as we call it. Uh, previously, it's been assumed that there, are certain, that there are certain objective, intellectually accessible moral truths which sort of carry an ought of their own, or else represent the ought that God has laid on them, if the truths are about God's commands, God's will. But Hume, without that uh, religious basis for an ethic, is committed as an empiricist to deriving ethical obligation uh, from nothing more than the empirical. You see, how you get an ought from these. And um, this is the problem that haunts uh, empirically oriented ethical theory from Hume's day until oh, well past mid 20th century. Uh, we'll be coming back to it again and again. Um, it seems to me that uh, the problem is related to the fact that the empiricism which uh, Hume is talking about is essentially the method of empirical science. He sees it as Newton's method. Uh, so the, the problem is that um, the 18th century conception of scientific method is that scientific thinking, scientific method is value neutral. You see. Or if you like, that the world which science is, is investigating, the Newtonian universe, is a value-free world, a world of value-free facts. And indeed, if all that uh, you have is, um, in the Newtonian picture, uh, particles of matter and blind forces at work, then there is no inherent purpose to the natural world, you see. Now, the theists among them, like um, Locke, Descartes earlier, see God's purposes involved in the way in which the mechanisms of nature work. But if all you've got is the mechanisms of nature, you have a world devoid of any moral significance in and of itself. You see. And I, I think it follows that if that's the case, the only way in which values arise is because of their instrumental worth as a means to something else, hence the utilitarian, as a means to some end that you assert, postulate, but you've still got the question of how do you get the ought, uh, what you ought to do, the ought how it is, there is moral obligation. Now, um, it's in regards to, then, the source of moral obligation, as well as moral knowledge, knowledge of what is good, that um, he has to appeal to sentiment. You see. So uh, while reason does contribute, indeed, in those matters, and particularly in terms of knowing something about the usefulness of alternatives, tell me, uh, it's the sentiment that he has to turn in order to um, get at any kind of moral uh, obligation. And um, you, uh, you recall there the, uh, the picture that we were talking about. What kinds of sentiments or feelings? Well, initially, the appeal is to benevolence, a, a universal, natural feeling of benevolence. Literally wanting what is good for others. Now, this in contrast to the sheer egoism of somebody like Hobbes, who's a natural benevolence. Why natural benevolence? How does he explain that? What's the psychology of benevolence? Well, it involves feelings of pleasure or pain about what is happening to other people, uh, which we uh, describe in talking of the sentiment of sympathy. Sympathy which we feel because of the factual similarity that's empirically observable between us and other people who are going through tough times. So that underlying the sympathy, uh, there is a significant dose of self-interest. So that even though um, benevolence is not by itself reducible to self-interest, it's related to self-interest. There's some combination of egoism and altruism. Now, these are all feelings, moral sentiments, impressions of reflection, if you like. And it's out of this that um, there arises then the sense of ought, so that the ought means simply that uh, I feel, I ought, I want then to have good, and so forth. And underlying this, that um, tinge of self-interest related to it. So that, in um, a nutshell, is um, Hume's ethic. And so the, um, the rules that um, amount to justice, you see, arising from that, justice is utilitarian in its intent. Um, he calls those rules laws of nature. But the laws of nature are the sort of thing which uh, we want for utility's sake in um, this context. Well, let me, let me pause there for your uh, reaction to this that we were doing last Friday. Yeah. Where does he get the ought? Does he feel like it's yeah. there just because they're ethics? Or? Yes, after all, um, any ethic is more than a description of what, in fact, people do. That's not ethics. That's sociology. You see. No, if you, want, uh, if you want to talk about ethics, you're talking of something that's normative. You say, what ought I to do? What is the good that I should pursue? Why be good? Why do good? That's the question. You say, age-old question. 
Um, and Hume's response is um, that we have an inner compulsion to do so. So in that sense, the ought is self-imposed, whereas for um, Hobbes, in the Leviathan situation, in the long run, it turns out, while it originates in sort of a self-imposed contract, it turns out to be socially imposed by the Leviathan. Um, in divine command ethics, where the ought is the will of God, divinely given. But in Hume, with his ethical subjectivism, it's kind of self-imposed thing. But don't jump to the conclusion from that that he's an ethical relativist. Uh, no, because the universal sameness of psychology is that the same kind of benevolence is characteristic in different degrees of all human beings. So he, he's trying to find a basis for morality, for moral obligation that is universally the same. And you have to look for something that's universally alike for that. And human psychology is where he looks. Yeah. David. Well, um, there you see, uh, if that is the case, what you say, David, uh, that there are some people whose natural benevolence is completely altruistic, unrelated to their own pleasure and pain, you see, uh, then you've got a difference of fact about human psychology. Uh, how would you argue yours? How would you argue his? Well, um, uh, the same juncture, and um, we'll say a little bit more about him later on. Um, you may remember from your intro course, you may, Dave, I don't know if the others read the same piece in theirs, but uh, Joseph Butler has a classic response to ethical egoism, or rather to psychological egoism, the view that everybody pursues their own self-interest above all. You see. His response is not that there are some human actions that are totally disregarding himself. No. Uh, his response is that they may have reference to the self, but the, uh, the primary concern in such actions is not that self-interest, but the object that one is after. You see. It's not self-absorbed. Egoism says self-absorbed. No, but even Butler, the principal opponent of egoism in that context, doesn't say uh, not even self-referential. No, he allows that. No, and I guess, um, I think if you can allow that, it defuses the situation because the egoist response is going to say, well, don't you get some degree of satisfaction out of seeing other people getting along nicely when you've had a hand in it? You see? Yeah, you do. Um, it's, it's much more satisfying, pleasing to uh, see people able to make ends meet than to see them starving. It's painful to. You know? You've got to take that sort of phenomenon into account. So the factual question becomes one of, um, uh, are there any human actions that are totally disregarding all possible self interest And Butler's inclined to say no. You see, the um, <coughs> egoism is not the view that there is self-interest, but that self-interest is the dominant, overriding, final, all-absorbing concern. So I guess I'm not worried about that. The other thing is, um, rather than someone who is that, they also get the opposite of the person who is someone 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 who no, that even, and uh, Butler and people like that do as well, uh, even though there are some very sadistic groups who love to see other people squeal, they still have some degree of benevolence for some, if only a pet dog. You see? That, that some degree of benevolence is uh, never completely uh, eradicated. Uh, the gangster who's got such a soft spot for his own kids, but doesn't think twice about killing a lot of other people. So, yeah. There was a Hitler who was very tender with his girlfriend. Well, that's a question of psychological fact. Uh, anything else? Okay, you see what Hume is doing? All right, let me um, move on then and um, say just a little about uh, the moral sense philosophers of the 18th century. Uh, four of them I've mentioned. In actual fact, of course, there were a lot more. But um, the four are the Earl of Shaftesbury, Francis Hutcheson, Adam Smith. That's the Adam Smith of Wealth of Nations. He was professor of moral philosophy at Edinburgh. Wrote a book on the theory of moral sentiments. Uh, and uh, Joseph Butler. Joseph Butler, who was an Anglican clergyman in a city pulpit in London. Most of his ethical writings that have come down to us are sermons he preached. They are much more like philosophical lectures than like any sermon you heard, I would wager. But um, that was the 18th century, I guess. Um, all right, so um, this um, school of thought, the moral sense philosophers, um, like David Hume, they are rooting ethics in human psychology, in moral psychology. They are affirming that we have some kind of moral sense in addition to the five senses some kind of moral sense, sentiment. And as we noted last time, um, Hume himself uses the phrase moral sense in talking about the, uh, the sentiments uh, in his own case. Now, uh, this moral sense philosophy seems to have arisen in opposition to Thomas Hobbes' egoism. Um, and in that regard, it sort of picked up the, um, the baton from the Cambridge Platonists of the 17th century. Uh, we talked about it a little bit when we were dealing with Locke. The Cambridge Platonists, of course, with their innate ideas, their opposition to the mechanistic view of nature, um, broad church people in the Anglican tradition. Uh, but um, with their belief in uh, real universals, therefore objectively real uh, ethical ideals, the Cambridge Platonists were 100% opposed to Thomas Hobbes. But not only to Thomas Hobbes. They were also opposed to the strong Calvinism that had flourished during the Cromwellian Commonwealth. Uh, this is true of the moral sense philosophers as well in the 18th century. Opposed to that strong Calvinism with a pessimistic view of human nature. 
uh, that maintained that um, there is no natural beneficence in human beings, that we're all completely egoistical. Hey, you see the issue facing up, egoism versus altruism? Uh, I remember when I was in graduate school, I heard a lecture by one of the early 20th century descendants of those um, moral sense philosophers, a British called uh, Broad, B-R-O-A-D, C.D. Broad. And he was lecturing on the question, egoism or altruism, question mark. You see, and he argued that he was either some sort of an egoistical altruist or some kind of an altruistical egoist, he wasn't quite sure which. Uh, but the method of his reasoning was by appealing to what seemed to him perfectly obvious. That's to say, we have a moral sense that enables us to, uh, to perceive when we understand the situation. What's right? Moral sense. Yes, in Broad's day, it was called intuition. So the 20th century descendants of this are called ethical intuitionists. Yes, ethical intuitionists. Broad was one of them. We'll meet a couple of others of them later on. G.E. Moore, W.D. Ross. But uh, the moral sense philosophers, anticipating that, you see, uh, are talking of a natural kind of benevolence that is inherent in our moral sensitivity. We're benevolent because of this moral sense, this moral faculty, which enables us to perceive the right from the wrong. The moral faculty, in, uh, indeed, has uh, three functions. It enables us to perceive the moral quality of an action, a situation. It enables us to approve or disapprove of that action or situation. And it motivates us to do what is good in regards to that situation. So it involves perception, moral perception, knowing the right, the good, uh, moral approbation, making moral judgments, and moral motivation. So that again, as you can see, the, uh, the moral knowledge comes there, and the ought, the obligation, comes from both the judgment and the motivation. And you'd have to translate the notion of duty or obligation to be the motivation, I, I've got to do this, the motivation which drives. Now, um, on this account, um, beneficence is not reducible to things like pleasure or self-interest, David. It doesn't rule it out, but it's not reducible just to that. It wasn't for Hume either. Uh, the moral sense is a kind of sui generis thing. It's, uh, it's distinctive. It's not reducible to any other human faculty. It's simply um, part of how God made us to function. So while you still have the ethical subjectivism, like in Hume, there's a theistic basis for it, which makes the motivation and approbation much more weighty than would have been otherwise. Now, um, while that's the overall picture for these moral sense people, uh, the, uh, there is still a major question which divided them. The question is whether this moral sense, whether this moral sense is basically cognitive or emotive. Is it a matter of reason or is it a matter of emotion? The same question as um, David Hume was dealing with. And uh, on that issue, the ones who said it's basically non-cognitive, a matter of taste, a matter of sentiment, are universal. Were Shaftesbury and, Shaftesbury and Hutchison, the first two that I put up here. Um, Adam Smith as well, though uh, not as fully, not as clearly. Uh, but at least um, uh, there are writers like um, Thomas Reed, the Scottish realist, who accuse him of having this ethic of feeling rather than of knowledge. On the other hand, um, Butler, and as we'll see, Thomas Reed in Scottish realism, who is very similar to this on ethics, Butler and Reed both say that this sense is a cognitive faculty, that it is a kind of knowing, not a kind of feeling. It involves ideas, clear ideas, uh, rather than just some feelings of pleasure or pain. Or what is it that good taste provides feeling of? If it's taste, good taste is what? Satisfaction? Pleasure? It's hard to avoid the term pleasure if you're talking of the emotive. So um, uh, this is the issue over which they divided. Now, of these people, um, you, you might find Joseph Butler perhaps uh, particularly interesting, uh, bishop in the Church of England that he was. Um, and for some people, he's of interest because he uses the word conscience to denote, to name, the moral sense. This moral sense that we all have is conscience. Um, and he, he goes at, uh, to great lengths in uh, developing this. And um, you can see how um, it parallels the, uh, the kind of thing which Hume and the others are up to. Um, conscience for... Um,